Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a woman who is a visitor to a movie hall and a man who is conducting a survey of the visitors visiting the movie hall. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Excuse me, ma'am. May I have a few minutes of your time? Yes. What do you want? First, welcome to Regal Movie Hall, the biggest cinema hall. We're conducting a survey of the visitors at the movie hall. We want to learn about when and how often people visit this movie hall. Would you mind answering a few questions about watching movies and visiting this hall? Not at all. Thank you. Today we're interviewing married women who visit the hall with their husband and children. So, the first question is, do you fit in this category? Yes, I do. OK. Now, may I know your age? I'm 35. Great. Now, how often do you visit this place? Is it once a month, less than once a month, or rarely? I and my husband both are very busy. We don't have much time to entertain ourselves. So, I visit this place during my kids' holidays. Well, that's fine. You must be very familiar with the stories here. Certainly, I am. All right, then. The next question concerns the things that you buy. What do you usually shop from the eating store? Well, my children are crazy for pizza, and my husband and I shop popcorn and cold drinks, respectively. Frankly speaking, their prices are a bit high. Now I need to know what type of movie do you and your family like to watch here and most often? Would it be animated? Oh no, that's only occasionally. The reason I come here is to refresh and change the monotonous routine. OK, that is great. So, the next question is for which show do you usually visit this place? What do you mean? I mean morning, afternoon, evening show or late night. Oh, it depends on the movie and tickets. With kids, we mostly prefer the daytime show. Now, there's one last question in this section. How do you usually come to the hall? I always drive. Now look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to the second half of the recording and answer questions 8 to 10. Fine. OK, the next part of the questionnaire concerns your opinion. In general, which part of the movie hall have you had the best experience? That's easy. I like the hall arrangement and services also. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? They have big comfortable seats to enjoy the movie for two to three hours. They do, but I consider it good because the employees are very polite. They provide exceptional services. Now, what about the washrooms? They're really very clean and hygienic, even easy to use for elderly visitors. That's really nice. I've just one last question. Do you have any suggestions for improvement of the movie hall? Yes, parking space should be increased. I never find a place to park. It's really annoying sometimes. That's all. Thanks for sparing your precious time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a radio talk about a charity project, Sewing Power. The talk is given by Dan Cross, who herself has initiated this project. First, look at question 11 to 15. Now listen to the recording and answer questions 11 to 15. My name is Dan Cross and I'd like to talk about the work of Sewing Pa, a small charity based mainly in Beijing. First, how the charity began. I got the idea of exporting sewing machines to underdeveloped and some developing countries while I was in Singapore. I went for an internship after graduating from university. There, I joined a voluntary organization and carried out a survey. The project ended after three years and I came back to Beijing and started planning for my dream project. The place where I used to live was an extremely rural area where people had nothing to do. My next door neighbor had a sewing machine as he was a tailor by profession. He was the only person in the village known to be successful. For many years, I couldn't understand why. Then I realized having a machine means earning bread and butter without much trouble. Other local tailors couldn't do this job, so no matter how skilled they were, they could never do as well as compared to my neighbor. At Sewing Pa, we collect second-hand machines and send them to some of the poorest regions in the world. When we distribute machines overseas, we don't give them away for free. The demand for machine is enormous, which makes them very expensive locally, so we sell them for 5% of the normal price. But in order to continue operating, we need to have a constant supply of sewing machines, which we send out every six months. One example of a town that received machines from Sewing Pa is Mavas. It was the first place I sent a full container of machines. Most people in the village now own a machine. The local economy has developed so much, you wouldn't recognize it as the same place. But Suing Pa still needs your help. You must have read about some of our recent problems in the local media. In January 2013, we were out of money. We had sewing machines ready to send, but no money to pay the bills. We managed to supply things in time, but the other problems remained for several months. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. Fortunately, in May 2014, our project won the Enterprise Award, which really helped us. We invested 10% of the £10,000 prize money to secure the future of the project. Winning the award helped us to raise our profile and the money helped us to raise our income by 50%. We're currently looking to invest in bicycles so that people can even improve their business. Because of our project, people in a number of countries now have a better standard of living. Now there are many ways in which you can support the work of Sewing Pa. You can donate your old sewing machine if you're planning to buy a new one. It doesn't matter what condition it is in, if we can repair it, we can use its spare parts to repair others. Of course, to do that, we always need tools which are expensive to buy, so we welcome any tools that you could give in kind. Also, you can help us by raising funds through organizing events. People do all kinds of things to help us. We hope that by talking on radio programs like this, we will be able to raise public awareness, 
which will bring forward the government organizations to give us regular financial support, something which is really needed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Julie and Michael, who are studying mass communication. Both of them are filling a feedback form. Look at questions 21 to 30. Listen to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. Oh, Michael, I have not filled the form which the tutor gave us in the class. The project feedback form? Yes. Shall we do it together, if you don't mind? OK, let's have a look. What is there in the form? Let's fill the first column. It's course code. Uh, it's mass communication. OK, mass communication. I know it. But the form demands a code. MS-18 something. MS-180, isn't it? Mm, that's it. OK. And what about the dates? When did we start? I remember. It was my mother's marriage anniversary on 24th April. It doesn't seem that long, does it? No, the course will end this week on Saturday, July 21st. So I'm sure the course started on the 20th of April. That was my mother's birthday. Now, let's have a look at the next question. Give comments on the different aspects of the course. OK, what's the first query? Oh, about the course contents. What do you think? Uh, they were very clear, isn't it? Yes, it's true. The content was absolutely clear. Uh, OK, anything else about the content? The best thing about the course is the sessions given to us online in the beginning. It was very useful, so I definitely put that down. Now, going on to suggestions for improvement, one thing I would like to give suggestion for, I think we should have done a bit more practice in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely correct. In the beginning, I thought it would be very easy, and then all of a sudden, in the second half, we got a whole load of work, reading, projects, and assignments. Yes, it would have been better if it was from the beginning only. OK, now course delivery. Does that mean teaching parts? Yeah, I suppose it is good. The standard of teaching is awesome. It's from the heart to the mind. I mean, the techniques, the audiovisual aids were amazing. Exceptionally better than any other course I've been on. Yes, I agree. Let's pen it down. What about suggestions for improvement? I, um, I didn't think. It was all wonderful when we had group discussion sessions that went on for so long. They should be limited to a specific time, not so long, otherwise the repetition of ideas start. Now look at questions. Now, on to the practical aspect of the course. Oh, now what was good about the lab sessions and handouts? Yes, in my opinion, the handouts were very good and some of them were really great, with sources and websites. One problem which most of the students faced was about the reserved copies in the library. 
Yes, there weren't enough copies on the reserve in the library, and not enough computers. Long waiting was there. Okay, testing and evaluation. Well, I can't comment on it until we get our written assignments back. Don't talk about it. I got mine yesterday. I really don't want to think about the marks I've got. But the presentation was good. The way I got feedback was excellent and quick. Yes, it was, and I liked the way and the criteria of evaluation. Yeah, but I'm not much confident about the written work. I personally think it's stressful. Yes, I agree. Here also, they must tell us about the criteria of marking. About the writing class tests, but they told us. No, for the finals. What are they looking for, and what is the criterion? How many marks for pass or fail? I never thought of it. It would be really helpful. Okay. Any other comments? I think student support is excellent. Yeah, me too. Excellent. I can't think of anything else. Okay, so that's done. Thanks, Michael. No, thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an extract from a talk given by a tour guide on the wax museum Madame Tussauds in London. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Madame Tussauds is a wax museum in London with branches in a number of major cities. It was founded by wax sculptor Marie Tussauds and was formerly known as Madame Tussauds. Madame Tussauds is a major tourist attraction in London, displaying wax works of historical and royal figures, film stars, sports stars, and infamous murderers. Madame Tussauds is owned and operated by Merlin Entertainments. Marie Tussauds. The pioneer of the museum was born as Marie Grosshals in 1761 in Strasbourg, France. Her mother worked as a housekeeper for Dr. Philip Curtis in Bern, Switzerland, who was a physician skilled in wax modelling. Tussaud created her first wax figure of Voltaire in 1777. Other famous people she modelled at that time include Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Benjamin Franklin. During the French Revolution, she modelled many prominent victims. Her death masks were held up as revolutionary flags and paraded through the streets of Paris. Following the doctor's death in 1794, she inherited his vast collection of wax models and spent the next 33 years traveling around Europe. Her marriage to François Tussaud in 1795 lent a new name to the show, Madame Tussauds. In 1802, she went to London, having accepted an invitation from Paul Philida, a magic lantern and phantasmagoria pioneer. To exhibit her work alongside his show at the Lyceum Theatre, London, she did not fare particularly well financially, with Philida taking half of her profits. As a result of the Napoleonic Wars, she was unable to return to France, so she travelled throughout Great Britain and Ireland, exhibiting her collection. From 1831, she took a series of short leases on the upper floor of Baker Street Bazaar, on the west side of Baker Street, Dorset Street, and King Street. Which later featured in the Drew Portland case sequence of trials of 1898 to 1907. This became Tussauds' first permanent home in 1836. One of the main attractions of her museum was a chamber of horrors. By 1835, Marie had settled down at Baker Street, London, and opened a museum. This part of the exhibition included victims of French Revolution and newly created figures of murderers and other criminals. Other famous people were added to the exhibition, including Horatio Nelson and Sir Walter Scott. 
some of the sculptures done by Marie Tussaud herself still exist. The gallery originally contained some 400 different figures, but fire damage in 1925, coupled with German bombs in 1941, has rendered most of these older models defunct. The cast themselves have survived, allowing the historical waxworks to be remade, and these can be seen in the museum's history exhibit. The oldest figure on display is that of Madame du Barry. Other faces from the time of Tussaud include Robespierre and George III. In 1842, she made a self-portrait, which is now on display at the entrance of her museum. She died in her sleep on 15th April 1850, but the museum has kept her alive and will do forever. By 1883, the restricted space and rising cost of the Baker Street site prompted her grandson Joseph Randall to commission the building at its current location on Marylebone Road. The new exhibition galleries were open on 14th July 1884 and were a great success. However, the building costs falling so soon after buying out his cousin Louisa's half share in the business in 1881 meant that the business was underfunded. A limited company was formed in 1888 to attract fresh capital but had to be dissolved after disagreements between the family shareholders. And in February 1889, Tussauds was sold to a group of businessmen led by Edwin Josiah Poiser. Edward White, an artist dismissed by the new owners to save money, allegedly sent a parcel bomb to John Theodore Tussaud in June 1889 in revenge. The first sculpture of a young Winston Churchill was made in 1908, with a total of ten made since. Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum has now grown to become a major tourist attraction in London, incorporating, until 2010, the London Planetarium in its west wing. It has expanded and will expand with branches in Amsterdam, Bangkok, Berlin, Blackpool, Hollywood, Hong Kong, Las Vegas, New York City, Shanghai, Sydney, Vienna, Washington DC, Wuhan, Tokyo, and the temporary museum in Busan, Korea with locations coming to Beijing, Prague, Singapore, Orlando, and Francisco. Today's wax figures at two sorts include historical and royal figures, film stars, and sports stars. The masterpiece itself speaks about its work. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.